Hi, everybody. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Palm Pachaco. I'm an assistant professor here at Osgood, and I'm delighted uh, to welcome you on behalf of myself and Professor Francois Tanguay Renaud and Professor Heidi Matthews. Uh, together, we organize this, the Emerging Trends in Criminal Justice Seminar Series, uh, which is sponsored by the Nathanson Center on Transnational Human Rights, Crime, and Security, with support from the Harry Arthurs Fund. Uh, and as you may know already, this series is now in its second year, and we bring together uh, a diverse mix of scholars from far and near, and in today's case, very near, um, <laughs> to uh, share ideas about criminal justice broadly conceived. And so we have scholars as well as journalists, policymakers, commentators, uh, working in various aspects uh, and subspecializations uh, from a diverse mix of methodologies and disciplinary perspectives and focused on criminal justice in its domestic, comparative, transnational, international, indigenous context. Um, so before we go further, I just want to start, it is, as is our practice here, um, with uh, recognizing the land uh, on which we're gathered. Uh, we recognize that many indigenous Nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located uh, that precede the establishment of York University. Uh, and we acknowledge our presence today on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. Um, the area in which we're gathered uh, has been taken care of by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis, and is now home to many Indigenous peoples. And we acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. And this territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Uh, so. I realize our speaker does not need much of an introduction, but I'm going to introduce him nevertheless. Uh, we are very pleased to be hearing from our colleague and friend, Professor Francois Tanguay-Renaud, who's of course uh, an associate professor here, as well as a co-director of the Nathanson Center, along with Professor Matthews. He's also the co-founder and co-director of York's uh, JDMA combined program in law and philosophy, uh, the founder of the Ontario Legal Philosophy Partnership. Uh, he holds many degrees, including degrees in civil and common law from McGill University uh, and graduate degrees, uh, including his PhD from Oxford, where he held multiple scholarships, including perhaps most notably the Rhodes Scholarship. He was a law clerk to Justice Deschamps of the Supreme Court of Canada. He's taught at multiple institutions. If I listed them all here, it would probably take up most of his speaking time, so I'll refrain. Um, but his academic interests span a wide range of subject areas viewed mostly through the lens of analytic legal theory, and these include, uh, of interest to us, of course, criminal law, criminal procedure, uh, criminal law theory. And uh, so with that in mind, he is now going to present to us his uh, work in progress, uh, Policing Necessity, uh, which among the many things to commend it includes his title. I always struggle with finding titles that are evocative and compelling and also pithy, and he has nailed that, and the paper itself is very interesting. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to him in just a moment. I'm also going to... Um, uh, apologize, I'm going to have to sneak out midway through this session for a committee meeting, and so uh, when uh, Professor Tanguay Renault is finished, I will uh, turn over the reins to Professor Matthews to um, manage the Q&A, so she'll moderate that portion. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say um, is that this is a, a casual uh, sort of get together, so please do feel free to get up and take advantage of the, the food which was organized by Liel Gonzalez, and I'd be remiss if I didn't thank her. She's really the logistical genius behind all of these events. So with that in mind, I will turn it over to Francois. Thank you very much, Palma. It's a real pleasure to be here. As academics, we're often um, asked to gallop around the world to present our work, um, and it's seldom at least at Osgood, that we get the chance to present amongst our peers. And so, so I'm, I'm very grateful um, for your decision to attend today. I hope you won't be uh, disappointed. Um, I say this because although the paper was circulated, it's a rather long paper. It's also a paper on which I worked some time ago, and then I just left there to macerate. Um, and so um, today I'm going to try to, because it's a long paper, I'd, I might not be able to cover it uh, in its entirety, I might uh, read some portion of it and speak to others, uh, going over some portions more rapidly than others. But I take it the paper was circulated such that you know, if you have questions about what I don't speak about, I'll be happy to entertain them as part of the question period. 
So, as uh, Palma mentioned, uh, I, my, my research focuses in part on criminal law and criminal procedure. Criminal procedure is a rather new endeavor in terms of my scholarship. I've taught it from, for some years, but in terms of engaging with it at the more theoretical level in print, it's, it's more novel. So if you've read the paper, you probably noticed that my take into it is a, a, a rather substantive take into criminal procedure. As in, I think of criminal procedure in light of what I know about um, criminal law. And because I don't think that the two should be disanalogized in the way that they're typically disanalogized in the context of law school teaching, right? So we have a course in substantive criminal law, another in criminal procedure, and for uh, decades now in most classes, they're taught separately. Uh, so what brought me to think, uh, to want to think about procedure in this way is that I, I, I came to realize a few years back that um, the police, despite its, its central importance in our society, was not very much theorized at all. There's a lot of criminal law theory focusing on, on the substance, but what about the the, the life of the criminal law, right? What really impacts people in their every uh, day life. Um, so, so the impetus of the paper is to say, okay, let's let's have a go at this. Um, and so, in the process of surveying uh, the literature on this, I realized, well, there isn't much, but there are. And so far as there are, they're pretty stark schools of thoughts, right? So you have, on the one hand, my former. Uh, doctoral supervisor John Gardner, who says, look, police officers should be thought of as citizens in uniform. They are people like you and I, and they just happen to wear a uniform. So in so far as they do things that you and I do, we should just think about that. And their uniform means, you know, in so far as they are given additional powers, then they're different, but otherwise they are not. Uh, Malcolm Thorburn at U of T has a diametrically opposed view. He says, uh, the police is just an arm of the state, right? It's different from you and I. One way in which that distinction plays out is in the articulation of the defense of necessity in criminal law. So John Gardner says when a police officer is accused of a crime and claims uh, a defense of necessity, he does so just like you and I do and should be ev evaluated just like you and I do. Malcolm Thorburn, on the other hand, says, surprisingly, he says, look, it's true that uh, the police officer should be evaluated like you and I when they invoke the defense of necessity in response to allegations of criminality, but that's not because um, the police are citizens in uniform, that's because when we invoke the defense of necessity qua individuals, we do so qua state officials. The defense of necessity is just a delegation to individuals to act in times of emergency when the state can't act. So the, pro the, the, the paper is trying to, at a very high level of abstraction, problematize that dichotomy through an, uh, through an exploration of what is referred to in Canadian criminal law as the ancillary powers doctrine. Uh, that was developed by the Canadian Supreme Court, but also finds uh, analogous representation in US jurisprudence. So it basically investigates the ancillary powers doctrine about which I'm, I'm going to speak in, in a moment uh, as an instance of um, lesser evils justification for uh, legal wrongdoing that's available to the police. The central point of the paper is to show that because the ancillary powers doctrine is a constitutional doctrine at its heart, and it's targeted state action, the justificatory standards of necessity to be applied ought to be different than the, uh, in the ordinary individual contexts uh, where uh, necessity is contemplated by the criminal law. And the reason is that the state is invoking the doctrine, and the state is in some key ways a different kind of agent than you and I. It's different, I think, both in terms of degree, it often has more resources, um, and to some extent uh, in terms of kind. Because I think of the state as a collective agent. So I don't think of the state as something like Malcolm Thorburn would say, a kind of, of, of a distinct kind of, of, of being. Right? But I still, in, in the sense that different standards ought to apply to it just because it is the state. Um, but I still think the state as a collective is different than just us qua individuals. Uh, so in the paper, you'll have read, I go through a number of what I think are similarities between uh, the two uh, doctrines, the doctrine of lesser evils in criminal law and the doctrine of uh, ancillary powers in constitutional law. Um, and I said, look, they are, they are properly analogized. And I'm going to say 
uh, a few things about that in a moment. But I still think that they ought to be differentiated um, because the state ought to be an, uh, an, uh, understood primarily as a collective, as an institutional uh, agent, or as part of a, uh, you know, a, a category of agent that, that call for a different kind of assessment, right? So, um, so, so I, I, I want to argue, and you'll see that I think different kinds of standards of necessity should be applied under the two doctrine, probably stricter for the state. Um, and I also want to say that um, given that we're talking of the constitutional context when we talk about the ancillary powers doctrine, uh, invocations of necessity in that context, that is by the police uh, in that context, should be assessed in terms of uh, the wider range of alternatives that will typically be available to it. Um, Quay branch of a better resource state. So the, the paper is really trying to drive a wedge between Gardner and Thorburn, and he does this by, if you want, advocating a wider prism, um, including both substantive criminal law and constitutionalized criminal procedure, through which to understand, if you want, the, the predicament of the police as a potential um, wrongdoer in need of justification, right? And this prism makes clear, I try to argue in the paper, that the police should not always uh, be treated as individuals, but that this also doesn't mean that individuals should be assessed along the same continuum uh, as the police, coy institution, or arm of the state. And in the last bit of the paper, you'll have seen, well, there's a coda. And there's a coda because throughout the paper, I assume that both the uh, doctrine of lesser evil, or necessity coy lesser evil, and the ancillary powers doctrine are legitimate doctrines, and that's sometimes something that is challenged. And I say, look, it's true that both doctrines pose a challenge from the perspective of the ideal of the rule of law because they are the kinds of doctrines that are applied ex post facto by courts. Uh, but I do think there are different reasons for both to um, defend their legitimacy. I argue that the criminal law doctrine uh, <coughs> finds its legitimacy in what I want to call the inevitable open texture of uh, rule-based criminal prohibitions and the kind of implicit democratic acknowledgement that comes with it, right? So the legislature, or, or it's impossible through rules to account for every possible situation, so you need to have pressure valves in the law that allow the courts to come in and recognize uh, morally salient justifications, even though they might not have been contemplated ex ante. The constitutional doctrine, uh, however, I think finds its justification not so much in democratic um, considerations, but in the ideal of the rule of law itself, because I think it enables uh, the legal, if you want, the legal delineation and the judicial control of the state, namely the police, where there is otherwise none. Right? So, so that's controversial. Most people in Canada do not like the ancillary powers doctrine. I tend to think we need it. All right, so let's just put the two doctrines that I want to talk about into focus. So, so there's a sense in which in many Anglo-American jurisdictions, but for Canada, um, there, is a, a, there is typically a, a notion of necessity that is recognized as a justification for what would otherwise be criminal wrongdoing, right? That's a doctrine of lesser evil, right? So, um, so individuals who infringe the criminal law in pursuit of a lesser evil or lesser harm may invoke that uh, justification in court. Uh, and the courts may recognize that their behavior was indeed a lesser evil and then hold them to be justified for their behavior as post, ex post facto. The ancillary power doctrine that I mentioned is typically not talked about in these terms, but uh, it struck me while teaching it that in fact the structure was very similar, right? So you basically found yourself in the ancillary powers context with courts authorizing ex post facto police behavior even when it would otherwise constitute a crime or a violation of constitutional law. So what's the ancillary powers doctrine? So the Supreme Court of Canada in a series of cases dating back to the 70s uh, and piggybacking on a, an obscure uh, British case that does, in fact doesn't have much play in England and, and Wales, um, 
recognize that it's, it's uh, that, so the courts recognize that they are in a position to uh, authorize ex post facto new powers of police when uh, the police has acted in a way that fits within the general scope of its duties. What are these general duties? The, the court says, well, we can say what those are as we go along, right? Statutory duties, but also common law duties, such as uh, the preservation of peace, the prevention of crime, the protection of life and property, as well as uh, bringing criminal offenders to justice. So that's the first criterion. The second criterion is, look, the police conduct in question, even if it's within the scope of uh, a, a, a police duty, must have involved, and those are the words of the court, an, an unjustifiable use of powers associated with the duty. So in other words, uh, you might think, while a, a certain course of police conduct uh, may advance the realization of relevant duties, uh, it may still not be permissible police behavior. You know, all things considered, for example, you might think because of the magnitude of um, rights violations that are involved. Now, in a series of recent uh, cases that, are, that we're dealing with uh, previously illegal, indeed criminalized uh, forms of forcible detention, search, seizure, the court actually effectively reduced the second criterion to the question of whether in the totality of circumstances the police conduct in question was reasonably necessary to the fulfillment of the loosely defined police duties to protect life, property, the public more generally. So the kinds of duties that I spoke about. This actually echoes what went on in the US, starting with a case called Terry v. Ohio. Um, the US has basically recognized that the, the Supreme Court of the US also has arrogated itself the power to uh, recognize ex post facto new police powers uh, based on considerations that are similar. Um, the test in the US is not as restrictive that in, as in Canada. It's basically whether a given type of police behavior is reasonable in light of legitimate police functions. So that you don't have so much the necessity component, but there are places in the jurisprudence where the necessity criterion is considered and sometimes applied. It's just that at this state in the development of the jurisprudence, it's not clearly necessity. I still rely on some US cases because that criterion is used at certain development, certain stages of development of the jurisprudence, notably in the first case, uh, Terry itself and a number of concurring opinions. So I think it allows me for a nice uh, comparative uh, kind of, of, of uh, backdrop to talk about the Canadian cases. Um, and in fact, it, it might, the paper might be uh, seen as an invitation to American courts to, to consider what we're doing here in terms of enf uh, emphasizing necessity as opposed to a broader reasonableness criterion when recognizing police powers ex post facto. So my initial uh, overarching point is that uh, the Canadian and at times the American judicial approaches uh, to the recognition of novel police powers do share uh, many similarities in structure. So, so they're not fully uh, parallel. So, so the necessity or lesser evil as a defense to criminal law, well, that's what it is, right? It's, 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 it's a permission to act in ways that would otherwise be uh, considered um, wrongful. Uh, it's not so much the recognition of a power, right? Notice that that's what the ancillary doctrine, uh, the ancillary powers doctrine is. Right? So, so were, you, were a police officer to be uh, accused of a crime and say, well, I had the power to do so, well, that would not be a justification. Right? It would be, well, I had the power to do so. Our criminal code, like many criminal codes in the US, do make it the case uh, by virtue of certain provisions that if the police do have the powers to do something, that will count as a justification. Right? But it's, it's the criminal code, it's those provisions of the criminal code that makes it the case. It's not the ancillary powers doctrine itself. But the main contrast I want to make is, look, when is lesser evil in invoked? When somebody commits a crime or, a or is alleged to have committed a crime, a legal wrong, and it's invoked as a justification. Right? In the history of the ancillary powers doctrine, it's been um, used to simply declare powers. But in its most recent iteration, it's been used mostly as a constitutional doctrine, and in fact in the US it is only 
a constitutional doctrine. So when is it invoked? Well, it's invoked in Canada, or it has been so far, in the context of search and seizure and arbitrary detention, uh, as if you want a, a justificatory analysis for what would otherwise be the infringement of um, interests or, or for, 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 the, for, for some legal wrongs that are very analogous to those for which necessity could be invoked in the criminal law. So when we're talking about detention, what are we talking about? Right? Things like, well, it could, the criminal law talks about forcible detention. Right? That's a crime. Um, holding somebody physically without their consent, well, that could be an assault. Right? Uh, searching someone without their consent, same kind of story. Right? So the ancillary powers doctrine is used in the constitutional context, not so much just as a doctrine recognizing power, but as a justificatory doctrine in and of itself. Right? So if you're familiar with the Canadian context, you know that typically the justification for a an infringement of constitutional rights happens under Section 1. The ancillary, doctrine, the ancillary powers doctrine uh, doesn't pay heed to that. Right? The court says, if indeed the ancillary doctrine is satisfied, if it was reasonably necessary for an officer to do what they did in the court of the realization of their duties, then that's going to be sufficient to justify an infringement of um, a constitutional right along the lines of what I mentioned to you. So you have really a nice parallel here. We're talking about two kinds of justificatory do doctrines that are grounded in the idea of necessity or lesser evil. So why, I say, why do I say lesser evil in the context of the ancillary powers doctrine? Notice, so, so, so it's reasonably necessary for the pursuant of a police duty. So the assumption here is those police duties are very important, right? So the, the protection of life and limb and property, um, protection against people, uh, protecting people from harm, ensuring social peace, right? These are very, very important social goods. And the court says, well, sometimes is it going to be justifiable to infringe people's liberty, the integrity of their person, or things like this, in the name of those goods? Because they're more important. Right? That's exactly the same structure as lesser evil. It's true that you have this idea of duty in there, but I'm not sure it changes very much to the analysis. You may want to think about this, but I'm not sure that that's where um, that we should pay too much attention to that structural difference. So that's where, um, that's where in the paper you'll see, I, of course, I analogize and disanalogize. I say, look, powers, justifications, there's a bunch of possible like minute uh, distinctions that might have implications, but that theorists may sometimes pay more heed than they should to, might not be as relevant in practice, although in some cases it will. Uh, what I want to say is, look, we have these two doctrines, two doctrines of necessity, which allow us to justify wrongs, legal wrongs. Should we then apply the same standards to these two doctrines? Um, so if you've read the paper, you'll have seen that. I go through a number of what I take to be the main criteria of the defense of lesser evils in jurisdictions in which it's recognized. So in Canada, lesser evil is not recognized as a justification. It's only recognized as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an excuse. But the discussion in the salient cases, Perka Latimer, is sometimes very akin to the discussion that we have in cases of justification. So, so even in the Canadian context, like there's a balancing of harm in the context of the excusatory uh, defense, which probably belongs more to a justificatory analysis. So in any case, so one criterion of the uh, criminal law justification of uh, lesser evils, as it's often encountered in Anglo-American uh, uh, jurisdiction, is that the evil, sometimes also referred to as the harm, in pursuit of which one um, infringe the criminal law must only be less than the evil or harm that would have resulted from adherence to the law. So for the defense to be successful, an accused doesn't need to show that um, she brought about the least possible evil or the least possible amount of harm consistent with the avoidance of the greater harm, right? Um, so despite... Uh, the fact that lesser evil is sometimes referred to as a defense of necessity, uh, an individual's action mustn't have been strictly necessary, is the point, for avoidance of a greater harm to qualify. And the policy rationale generally uh, cited in support of this uh, criterion uh, is that, you know, despite 
the absence of positive legal duties of assistance uh, in Anglo-American jurisdictions, so it's, it's not criminal not to go and help out people who are in uh, peril, uh, the defense of lesser evils is, itself is, is just permissive, right? So, 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 so that's the way the defense is framed. But despite this, individuals shouldn't be dissuaded from seeking to reduce overall harm or evil around them. And the thought is, well, a requirement that an action be strictly necessary to prevent a greater evil, or that it be less harmful, uh, that it be the least harmful, sorry, way of doing so, uh, the thought, well, it, that is that it could well have uh, that effect. You know, just given how much more onerous it might be uh, to satisfy than just a requirement that the action be less harmful. So should necessity be assessed in the same way in the context of the ancillary powers uh, doctrine, right? So uh, now, as I mentioned, when uh, courts invoke the ancillary powers doctrine, nowadays it's typically in response to constitutionally wrongful or alleged cons uh, allegedly constitutional, constitutionally wrongful behavior uh, by, uh, by the police. And so the intuition here is, of course, the police uh, should be held to stricter standards, right, um, than ordinary individuals. Uh, because you might think, well, it's got, it'll often be easier for them to prevent uh, evils in, in, in less harmful, in less harmful or, or, or otherwise evil ways than ordinary individuals. So the, the key case in the US is Terry v. Ohio. Um, Terry V. Ohio, you have a, a Officer McFadden who's in Cleveland looking at two individuals casing a, casing a store, walking in front of it, and he's suspicious that they're up to no good. They, they case the store, they meet on one corner, talk, and then continue to do that for about 12 times. Uh, so the claim here is uh, Terry, uh, McFadden needs the power to be able to uh, intercept these people, even though he doesn't have the grounds for arresting them at that point. Right? Because otherwise it might be too late. Right? They might just get in and commit a holdup kind of thing. And also needs the power to search them in order to protect themselves in case they have weapons. Right? So you might think, well, how should we think about this? Right? Should the court say, well, it's necessary for him to have this power because in these circumstances he needs to have the power? Or uh, should we say, look, this officer could possibly call in other resources, could call in for backup, that might actually make the situations a lot less worse. And so presumably it's not necessary for him to just have this power in those kinds of circumstances, right? So, uh, so you might think, well, intuitively, the second option might be better, right? So that might be where we should land. Uh, but we don't really have a normative argument for this yet. Um, because you might think, well, if individuals have opportunities to do less harm while uh, pursuing a so-called lesser evil, then they should probably take that route. Uh, so why hold the police to a stricter standard? You might say, well, the police, you know, look, it's an institution. Like, they, they, there are many people acting together. Uh, they're the paradigm kind of a group that acts together. You might think an army is even more of a paradigm, but, but a police force, right? So, so presumably, we should add, in a, in a case like Terry v. Ohio, the court should have thought about the fact that Ter McFadden was not alone. They should not just have assessed him uh, you know, in this kind of discrete situation on his own. But again, we don't have a normative argument. So, so one normative argument that has been put out there for uh, the police to be held to stricter standard in those circumstances is that, look, it is part of the role of a police officer, both historically but also normatively, uh, to protect people from harm. That's why we have this kind of role, right? So over and beyond what you and I have as a moral duty, if you want, to protect each other, the police officers are there for that, right? It's also the case that police officers swear that they're going to take these heightened uh, duties, if you want, through oaths of office. Indeed, they're typically more resourced than us. In fact, they typically, the police typically has a quasi-legal monopoly over certain kinds of means of addressing uh, social harm. 
And it, it puts us at a, at, at a disadvantage, right? I can't just be carrying my gun here just in case, right? There's a bunch of regulation that prevent me to do this, and that they're more permissive for the police acting in the course of their duties. So you might think, look, uh, it's not very controversial that, to assert, even at the normative level, that police officers have a heightened duty to protect people from harm, right? Uh, now, how does this relate to the question of which standard of necessity is appropriate? Well, you might say, because they have this heightened duty to prevent harm, any harm that they're going to inflict, right, even if it's a lesser evil, um, is going to be problematic. It's going to be problematic in the sense that it breaches the very heightened duty to prevent harm that they have. And one might think, well, breaches of duties matter. They matter morally, and they matter legally. So courts would be on sound moral grounds, you might think, to hold the police to higher standards, to say, look, in this case, maybe an individual uh, t sh should be held to, 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 to lesser standard. But like, if the police indeed can call for backup, sometimes we should expect that more from them than, say, an individual uh, faced with an imminent danger. Um, so we should perhaps, for example, expect the police to act, act jointly in a more uh, as a matter of course basis, right? Now, notice that the normative argument that I just made uh, rests on the demands of the role of police officer in general. It doesn't rest on an understanding of police officers as agents of the state. Uh, so this argument for a stricter necessity, necessity threshold uh, argue, arguably applies whenever necessity is invoked by the police in response to allegations that they've acted wrongly. Right? So it applies to invocations of the criminal law defense of lesser evils by, 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 by officers. It may also apply to police invocations of the ancillary powers doctrine. In so far, that is, as the predicament of individual officers is the proper target of assessment. And on this last point, there's actually a lot of room for debate, I argue. And to see why, well, let's, let me just uh, backtrack a little. Um, to some, the fact that, you know, so far I've insisted on just articulating my discussion in terms of joint action, you might think, by police officer, as opposed to, say, uh, the harm reduction expectations that might flow from their greater resources or their greater training, you say, well, that might be awkward. So, so one reason that I do this is because, well, it's often not noticed by court that there is this alternative out there, that the police don't act alone. But it's also because I think it points to an important, deeper distinction here uh, between the subjects of assessment. So I've, over the last few years, I've engaged quite a bit in my own work with the, lit the, the literature, um, the recent literature on group agency, which suggests that even when uh, lone police officers carry out what are allegedly uh, necessary police actions, uh, these may still be attributable, at least in part, to wider collective agents um, and, and be properly evaluated as such. Of course, the collective agents that I'm referring to here, they're, they're police forces, more broadly the state, right, whose goals, programs, strategies, it's part of police officers' role to implement. So the question then becomes whether it is the necessity for individual police officers or for broader collective agents for which they work that should be evaluated when applying other doctrine. Now, the, 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 the literature on group agency is quite a complex one, and it requires a lot of um, background knowledge to fully assess it in the philosophy of action, uh, in uh, moral philosophy generally, and even metaphysics to some extent, right? So I can't really rehearse full arguments here, but the line of argument tends to be that a group agency will typically be thought to require that a group of individuals act according to some kind of collective decision procedure. This procedure has to be such that it allows the group to be responsive to reason over time, qua group, in a reasonably consistent way, and in turn, uh, structures actions uh, that then count as responsive actions of the group. That is, action that can be attributed to it and for which 
the group may be properly held responsible. And this institutional decisional framework should allow the general wisdom tends to be, for those who accept these views, the group to, to formulate, if you want, its, its, its goals, its desires, its judgments, its strategies about how to realize its, its desires and plans, often in ways that can't just be reduced uh, easily to the desires, plan, judgment, strategies of the individuals who form the group. Um, and it should also allow the group to delegate uh, you know, corresponding uh, actions to individual members. Um, they're sometimes referred to as role bearers in that literature with the presumption that they're going to act and that if they don't act, specific individuals are going to be replaced, right? So the group is going to keep acting. And then there's a bunch of discussion about, okay, groups have other criteria. If they're going to be agents, they need to be persistent over time in terms, even if their membership changes. They need to have an ability to revise their decisions in light of input that they get, uh, such that they can responsibly uh, respond to action. Uh, and, and the importance of these agents, insofar as one buys these kinds of arguments, is often defended in terms of the greater, the better results that over time can be achieved through them, you know, uh, sometimes far beyond their individual members' capacity. And so in paper, the point that I make is if there are any, indeed any such collective agents, police forces, given their tight organization, the way they operate, and states as a whole are probably the best contenders. Uh, and so uh, it's worth thinking about them in those, uh, those cases. Of course, if you're going to think about police forces and states that group agents, then there's additional complication as to can a group agent nest within a group agent, and how are we going to evaluate the action of each agent differently. Um, so one general point to make is this, right? When it comes to police forces or, or whole states, qua group agents, uh, the issue of uh, whether in the context of assessment of allegedly uh, necessary action, uh, they should be expected to go to greater lengths than ordinary um, individuals, uh, that is to act collectively, to act together, remember my point about Terry uh, v. Ohio, so as to minimize harm. So the assumption in Terry v. Ohio, v, v Ohio might be, look, if the police act together, there's going to be less chances that it's gonna, the situation is going to misfire. There's going to be less harm, and that's why it should be privilege. Um, the point is, I think when we're thinking about group agents, the argument here is a bit simpler. Because as group agents, whatever necessary action they claim to take qua groups, well, then they must be ev evaluated in terms of the opportunities that they, qua groups, had to act. So you might quibble, well, say, well, all the actions of group agents are carried out by individuals because groups don't have arm and legs of their own. Uh, but insofar as it's the group behavior that's evaluated, I think the relevant question here is, conceptually speaking, it's what the group could have done in the circumstances. Now, coming back to my earlier point, it also seems to follow, I think, at a normative level, that if police officers uh, considered as lone agents have, um, as part of their role, if you want, a heightened uh, obligation to minimize harm by acting together, so do um, agential organizations that they make up, right? Uh, and that exists to, to facilitate the realization of these duties. Indeed, I think uh, these kinds of organizations' ability to identify, to strategize, to implement less harmful courses of action are typically going to be greater than those of individual officers and even of, of individual officers acting just jointly. So we're talking of a different class of agents here. So, so and that's because these organizations uh, collective decision procedures tend to bring with them greater capacities for just gathering information to basically inform their judgments about uh, the harms to be inflicted and, and the harms that can be averted. As well, you might think, as greater uh, coordination of uh, the individual actions together, that, that, that together, sorry, make the group's uh, strategies for discharging their duties. So, so, so such organizations will often have 
more reliable beliefs is the point about which arms are superfluous because of their greater capacity and are going to be more capable of acting effectively on those beliefs, again, because they have greater capacities. So in so far as there indeed are collective agents, and of course there's an if here because I haven't defended this, uh, which um, the law can, can, can recognize, or at least you might think even at the level of fiction that the law can intelligibly uh, postulate, uh, then you have important new vistas that open up through which to assess the contours of policing necessity. Of course, when it's individual officers who invoke the defense of necessity and it's their culpability that's at stake, they are charged, then you might think, okay, it's their necessity, it's their, uh, their, their resources that we should assess, right? So, and, and, and the standards should probably be closer to that of you and I. But when it's the state that is charged, and it's actually possible in Canadian law, few people realize this, I've written on this, but if you look at our corporate uh, criminality provisions, a corporation, a corporate body could be a public body, could be a police force, right? It could be a municipality, it could be. It, it doesn't happen for political reasons, but it's still possible that the police force would be charged. Then in those cases, you might think the standards should be higher. Now, here we come to the ancillary powers doctrine, which tends to be invoked in the constitutional context. Well, here we have the added uh, fact that, well, the constitution both in the US and Canada by virtue of doctrine can only apply to state action. And if indeed the state is a collective agent, then we know that in that context, collective standards are gonna have to be imposed, right? And are, are gonna be the ones that ought to govern, right? So, so in Canada, there's a jurisprudential debate as to whether uh, indeed, uh, you know, the ancillary powers doctrine as a sole justification should remain as such, but that's the law currently. Uh, but even if it were not, my point is, look, the ancillary powers doctrine allows the court to, to recognize powers, and they're the powers of whom? Who's delegating their powers? Well, the court does it in the name of the state, right? So again, we end up th thinking about the state, um, essentially. Now, another key difference upon which you might think a, a, a careful comparison between lesser evils and ancillary power doctrines uh, sheds light, has to do with which alternatives should be judged available or not, right? When we're assessing whether an illegal action was necessary to bring about a greater good. So in colloquial parlance, um, asserting that a course of action um, is necessary to the realization of some end that's often taken to mean that there is no alternative to it, right? So the end in question would not be realized otherwise. Now, this way of thinking often finds um, its way into the criminal law defense of lesser evils through a requirement that there be no effective legal alternatives. Um, so it's not as... Uh, directly woven into the ancillary powers doctrine, but there is some recognition in recent uh, jurisprudence that that's also a criterion. Like if you look at the cases of O'Quinn and um, the majority by LaBelle and a dissent by uh, Justice Deschamps in a case called R.V. Mann, which is the equivalent of Terry in our, uh, juris in our jurisprudence, that criterion seems to figure out there, even though not as crystallized as it may be in the context of lesser evil. Now, Moral philosophers don't like these kinds of questions. They are hard, right? So it tends to be a matter of degree, they think, how difficult it is to envisage as if you want as realistic or as reasonable or as possible, um, you know, how, if you know, how realistic, how reasonable, how feasible would be an alternative course of action in which a given end would be realized. Uh, so, that kind of assessment is often going to depend on how that threshold of, reali of realism or, or reasonableness is set. Now, the point is thrown in especially sharp relief when it comes to states, right? Or you might think more specifically police forces, because these bodies typically have access to very significant resources that they could choose to allocate or not to the creation of alternative ways of discharging their duties. So you might think, right, building on my earlier discussion of joint and group agency, 
These kinds of allocative decisions might involve right, police forces choosing to deploy more people on the ground, uh, train their officers better. Yeah. You might think, well, insofar as police forces have constrained resources that are going to prevent them from making these kinds of policy choices, well, then relevant allocative decisions uh, may also be those of higher state instances uh, within which the police forces are nested. So decisions about resourcing of police departments uh, themselves uh, or about uh, you know, tackling uh, the kinds of issues that we deem to be necessity inducing in the context of uh, ancillary, the ancillary powers doctrine through other means, right? through, through non-police-led forms of state action. You might, you know, education, or I don't know how, sometimes you might think human behavior might be influenced uh, differently than just by the, the, the hard gavel of the law, right? So an important question is then the extent to which courts should um, expect the state and specific state agencies like police forces uh, to generate alternatives, right, through different deployments of resources before conceding that uh, new police power, new police, or new police power is necessary indeed to the realization of police duties, right? Um, so the question here is again, what courts should what should courts do in uh, these kinds of situations, right? So in the case of necessity, the criminal law defense, when you have an individual claiming necessity, it's often going to the case that the court is going to ask, you know, what were the alternatives available to that individual? Right. In the constitutional context, that's also what the court tends to do. It tends to ask in a context like Terry, what were the resources available to McFadden, Officer McFadden, right there and then? Right. The point I'm trying to make here is that, look, it's not McFadden in and of itself here that's evaluated. It's the state, it's the, it's, it's the police, right? And so the question then becomes, well, should the court be asking the question of what alternatives the police have, right? Before recognizing a power that is then going to stick with us for the ages, because once it's recognized uh, in the case law, it becomes a power that the police have ends for. Uh, the courts have typically been very reluctant, unlike in the individual necessity context, to think about you know, reasonable alternatives. Because of, and that takes us into more general debates uh, about um, you know, institutional design and, and uh, you know, relative legitimacy, because courts don't think of themselves as democratically legitimate. Right? They say, well, who are we, the courts, to make decisions about the allocation of resources in those contexts, that should be left to the legislative branch, right? Which is more accountable, even if not fully. Another set of objection has to do with institutional competence. You might think, and that's the kind of argument Lon Fuller would make, right? He would say, look, there's some issues that are deeply polycentric. They're so complex, courts should just not touch them, right? They're just likely to make things worse if they do. Right, so again, legislatures might be a better place here because they have the resources that kind of, you know, they can have committee where they can call in experts in a way that courts can do. Uh, and so does that mean then that courts should just not think about the alternatives available to the state even though they are assessing the behavior of the state? Well, as you can imagine, since we have an ancillary powers doctrine, the courts weigh in, right? And they typically weigh in on the ground that, look, the goods that are furthered by the police are so important that you know, if no other branch of government is going to enable the police, somebody has to, right? But at the same time, they're conscious of their democratic and competence-related uh, def competence deficit. So what they tend to do in the context of the ancillary power doctrine is to say, look, we're just going to recognize powers in what we're going to call a case-by-case -case basis. We're going to say we're recognizing a power in the totality of the, the circumstances present here. If the circumstances differ even by one iota, we're going to have to be called upon to educate again, right? Typically, it doesn't always go up to the Supreme Court again if it's very similar, but that's the, that's the story there, right? So we end up in a situation where the courts do weigh into ancillary powers. Like, they do declare powers, and they feel that they don't have the democratic legitimacy or the competence sufficient to really assess what the... Uh, what, what's, what's necessary or not. So, so it's a kind of a perverse box that the uh, 
uh, Cortes stuck himself in. And you might think that, look, legislatures might be very happy with this because police powers are a very controversial topic, right? So we live in the era of things like Black Lives Matter, I don't know more, right? Which have a lot of things to say about the police. So how convenient might that be for legislatures to just say, look, courts, you do the work. If you do it well, we're gonna let it stand. If you don't, we might just weigh in a bit later on, right? Um, so that tend to be the state of play in both Canada and the United States on those issues. The legislators tend to be very content with the invocation of the ancillary powers doctrine. Uh, but note this, right? So that's kind of, in a scenario like this one, it's basically the state saying, look, we're gonna engineer the kind of necessity. We might even refrain from giving powers to the, or, or resources to the police, uh, such that the police then claims in front of a court, well, we need to have these additional powers because we don't have the resources to do otherwise. And the court might say, well, look, we're looking at your situation here and then, that's true, we're gonna recognize the power. And so you, you see the way in which somebody could basically be the, the government could basically be the architect of the necessity that is then recognized by, by the court, right? So, so in the context of the individual defense of necessity, somebody who has created the necessity Right, the situation of necessity, can then not invoke necessity as a defense. Right? So you can't invoke, you, you, you can't invoke your own turpitude to justify your, own, your, 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 your wrongdoing. Right? But in the context of the ancillary power doctrines, it seems that that's a possibility right now. And so in the paper, you'll see, I say, look, courts have to realize this. It's true that the police need important powers. They realize very important goods in our society. Right? But if the courts are going to weigh in, then they have to take responsibility for what they're doing. And that means that they need to uh, pay a bit more attention to what's going on, right? So that might not be a full uh, assessment of the resources of the state. Courts probably will never do this on grounds of democratic legitimacy and, and lack of, of, of competence. But they might still ask the case, the, 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 the police to present a case, right? To present some evidence, have some evidentiary threshold that they actually need, right? So you might say, well, maybe you don't go and investigate all the resources of the state, but maybe you demand some, some information about the, information, the, the, the resources of a given police force that's at stake, right? And even if you're not going to do this, you might want to say courts are used in the administrative context in reviewing reasonableness determination in the context of the administrative state galore. That's what administrative law is about, right? So why not just delve in a bit more here? So it's an imploration to court to say, look, the question of which alternatives are available such that a situation is, is deemed to be necessary or not, uh, the commission of wrongdoing is deemed to be necessary or not to uh, further a lesser evil, that's a question that is rife with a question, the, the, the issue of what resources somebody has in the situation. And in the constitutional context, when we're thinking about the state, you can't but ask that question a little bit. So the standard ought to be different in these ways. All right, so I've already taken a lot of time. There is a coda, as I mentioned to you at the end of the uh, article. Let me just speak to, to it briefly. So the, the defense of lesser evils tends to be decried as, um, uh, if you want, uh, anathema to the rule of law because the thought is, look, you're giving the power to individuals to take the law into their own hands. So there's an acknowledgement that the law can speak to every situation. And in some situations of extreme pressures, some individuals will be able to say, look, it was necessary for me to break the law in order to uh, uh, realize a lesser evil, right? And you might say, well, you don't want to leave individuals to take the law into their own hands. And so there is, in order to answer this uh, worry, in most uh, jurisdictions where lesser evil is recognized, a, a requirement that uh, before you can invoke necessity successfully, you need able to, de to demonstrate that you couldn't um, consult with appropriate legal authorities before you did that, right? So there's a kind of a last resort uh, argument here. But notice that in the context of the ancillary powers doctrine, uh, so, so, so if indeed that uh, retort cabins the rule of law worry, or at least you know, makes it so that we still think that overall we should have a defense of lesser evil, in Canada we think we shouldn't, but in other jurisdictions they do, then the question, what about in the context of ancillary powers? Should, should uh, you first have court approval? Maybe, 
maybe the police should first go to, maybe that should be a change in practice where the, the, the police should first go to the court. Right? But notice the kind of behavior that's at, typically at stake in ancillary powers context is typically low visibility police behavior. It's behavior that typically wouldn't be noticed, right? So imagine Officer McFadden stops Perry on the street about, and, you know, Terry is scared, goes his way. Well, there has been no crime and so no legal process that is engaged. And so this kind of behavior is not going to be, uh, come to the attention of the court. So yes, you can impose this kind of requirement. What tells us that it's going to be respected? And you could say, well, what are their legal authorities you could be? Well, maybe the officer should consult a higher up, right, within the police force. We have this in our law of arrest, right? You have these balance and checks. You can only arrest someone and detain them for so long before checking with somebody else. You know, there's a kind of gradation, right? But again, here you have conflicts of interest. You can say, well, police forces will have interests in the police doing what police does, right? So... So the kind of retort we have in the necessity context and the criminal law context might not apply here. And people worry gravely. So James Trubopoulos, our former colleague at Osgood, has made a career of decrying the ancillary powers doctrine. For him, he says, look, you're basically telling us that the individuals on the street can never know whether the police have the power to do what they're doing, right? They could just do something and then try ex post facto vindication in, in courts. Uh, you're also telling us that the police themselves can never really know what they have the power to do. And that's a problem. And indeed, that's a true problem. But here's another way to think about this, which makes me think that despite these problems, we may need to have an ancillary power doctrine. As I mentioned to you, the kind of behavior we're talking about tends to be low visibility. Right? It also tends to be the case that it's behavior that led the legislature doesn't go about legislating. So what does that, what, what happens? Well, stop and frisk, what is recognized as a power in Terry was something that was happening in American society, presumably in Canadian society much before man also, unbeknownst to the law. I mean, the police knew it, people knew it, but there was no statutes governing it, and the courts were not speaking to it. So the Warren Court in the US at the time of Terry, which was a very pro-civil rights court, the whole question of constitutionalization of criminal proceedings, criminal procedures in the 60s in the US was basically to address the question of you know, big problems of discrimination, et cetera, that were you know, unfolding and that were just not captured or addressed by the law. So the court says, we're gonna step in, in order to have a say, right? So by making this behavior legal in some way, it allows us to set standards for it, right? It allows us to try to weigh in to govern what's going to happen. Ideally, the legislature should do it. They have much more legitimacy and probably competence to deal with it, but if they're not, is it better to just let it slide than to intervene? There's certain literature on the rule of law. Uh, Jeff King at uh, University College uh, London, Timothy Endicott in Oxford, which says, look, the rule of law is not just about guidance. Some people tend to think about the idea of the rule of law. That we should know what the law says so we can guide our behavior accordingly. The idea of the rule of law also has something to say as to when there should be law, when the, the law should get involved. And the, 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 the thought here seems to be that if by the law getting involved, it can lead to more justified action on the part of the state, then the law should get involved, right? So, so the thought might be that the Warren Court is not, in, by recognizing a sort of ancillary powers doctrine, uh, just showing the finger to the rule of law, it's actually trying to rein it in, right? And so the point is, there is a place for uh, something akin to an ancillary power doctrine. Now, there are big problems with this because, of course, judges are weighing without the kind of competences that they need to be able to micromanage police, right? And so what you've seen in the U.S. is an expansion of the kind of Terry powers to all sorts of realms in a way that's uncontrollable. And we're starting to see that in, in Canada, too, right? So the ancillary power doctrine is invoked every year by the Supreme Court in this or that cases. Uh, when, when there's no previously recognized police power to do X, right? Um, so, you know, which side of the argument should win? My sense is it's good for the law to have a toehold in these situations, and if there's not going to be anybody else, then it might be a, a risk worth taking, but that doesn't mean we should leave the courts uh, without scrutiny, which is the kind of thing that I'm doing here, right? So I'm trying to scrutinize the doctrine that has been posited by the courts because I, won't, I want to hold them to... Uh, Certain, uh, a certain kind of, of, of reflection about what they're doing, right? So, but the paper assumes 
that for this to be valid or important inquiry, that there needs a place for the doctrine. So that's why you have the code at the end of the paper. So I've, read, I, I've really uh, spent too much time now talking, but at the same time, I've, I've kind of taken you through the most, the most important moves of the paper, and I'll be happy to welcome any kinds of criticisms or devastating comments or, or you know, <laughs> encouraging or uh, praises. So <laughs> please. <laughs> So I might have missed uh, something at the beginning. I hope not much. I hope. <laughs> um, so, so, so my first sort of question, you uh, toward the end, uh, I think you you engaged it, uh, which is, <clears throat> it might be useful to think about this in the context of to whom. Uh, do this, this, in what direction do these displacements of rights occur, right? So, <laughs> so imagine a judiciary that is more diverse. Imagine a judiciary who themselves get regularly stopped and fixed. To what extent might their, you know, uh, sort of tolerance for <laughs> slave powers uh, be this high? So it's a question of thresho thresholds, right? So, so I'm trying to kind of almost repoliticize okay. you know um, <laughs> you know uh, that whole discussion right mm -hmm. so that's that's one thought and you kind of addressed it and you kind of mm -hmm. mentioned you know uh, I don't know about you know uh, black lives matter and connected to that again toward the end is because I uh, the way I read I may I, I may misread this but the way I read your argument is which is you know a completely reasonable argument is that the way to ensure that these sort of low visibility behaviors, right, are brought to the attention of the law, almost, and you know, sort of, you know, brought within the zone of the rule of law, right, is literally for judges to act, right. But historically, if we, were, you know, if you look at the civil rights movements and the actual gains in civil rights, right. That may not be the only way to, to, uh, to force the legislature or even the executive to act, right? So in fact, the way to do it is actually to intensify Black Lives Matter, right? right? Which may actually be a more pro-human rights way of doing it than to leave this unaccountable and in your view, not that all that competent judges. And in my <laughs> view, right. uh, not all that sensitive. Right judiciary that is not diverse enough, in fact, not even close to being diverse enough, right. who don't have the experiences I have being stopped several times right. <laughs> for no reason, right. right? So imagine I was a judge, yeah. right? <laughs> imagine my perspective. So that, that, that's what I wanted you to kind of reflect on. Yeah. Right, so listen, I think, I think we're in, in, in broad agreement on everything you just said, right? So, so of course, if, judges were more in tune with what people who face these situations um, experience, then it might be that their judgments would be different. We see that throughout the law in every context, right? So I teach criminal procedure. I'm basically, I have a student here. I basically tell my students in every context, right? Look, the court is now telling you what privacy is. Look what they're emphasizing, a big property, you know, a detached home, like that's what's given the kind of heightened protection under a law of search and seizure, right? And you might think, well, the, the same kind of problem will, you know, trickle to any kind of situations where they're going to be called upon to make a judgment on situations that they have no idea about, right? So that goes directly to my point about competence and democratic accountability. I think, I think there's just one, one version of it, right? So you might say, look, if, if the court was really representative, then there would be more of an argument for them to make better calls. It's never going to be fully representative, especially the Supreme Court is nine people. I, you, we see that, right? So you could have you know, one, aboriginal, gonna, one aboriginal person on the court. That's a big debate. Is that going to make the court more representative? No, right? So you could have, you know, perhaps like everybody celebrates there's one Italian. Like the point is you will not be able to achieve this the way a legislature could, right? So the point is, sure, right? But what if nobody acts, right? Which is your second question. What if nobody does anything about it, right? So, so the point is, 
So intensifying Black Lives Matter in this context would matter if it prompted the government to act, right? If it prompted the government to weigh in, really evaluate what police power, how police powers are shaped and say, we're going to do just this. James Trubopoulos' point uh, argument is in, along those lines. He says, look, the UK has done it right. Police powers, despite the fact that the Waterfield Doctrine comes from the UK, most police powers are statutory, right? And that's allowed for better deliberation, and he tends, in general, to think police powers are just better framed as a result, right? In Canada, though, we have a very timid legislature. And in fact, in the US, too, the legislature of late has been very timid of weighing into these kinds of problems where you think you'd really want them to weigh in because it's so politically charged, right? So the worry is, well, so the question then is, well, what do we do? Do we then just say, so intensify Black Lives Matter? Yes, right? So th that doesn't work uh, orthogonally to my argument, as in, yes, it should intensify, and perhaps the legislature should weigh in, right? The point is, what if they don't, right? What if Black Lives Matter doesn't succeed? Then what do we do? Is it better for the courts to say nothing? Or whenever it catches a case like this, which happens to come before, then it's not seldom. There's probably a bunch of police practices we have no idea about, right? Um, teaching criminal procedure, a few years back, I had somebody from the Citizens Lab at U of T come to speak to my class about MZ Catcher, like the Stingray operations, you know, these fake cell towers that catch signals um, and then allow it to locate an individual and give you a bunch of metadata. The police never claimed they were using that technology until recently where it blew up in a, in a case in Quebec. And the thought was whenever it came to get close to being revealed at trial, they would drop the case, right? So we know that that's endemic. So the question is, okay, the police has now dared bringing this to the Supreme Court, right? Or there is a situation where, not necessarily the police, but the case makes it so that it's possible to address it, should the court say something about it? And my point here is, look, it's the responsibility of the state as a whole, and the court is one part of the state. It's not the most democratically accountable, it's not the most competent, but in so far as the only branch of the state that's willing to weigh in, then weigh in. At least there's a chance they're gonna do something, right? Empirically, we could check whether they indeed do any good, whether, or whether the, 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 the bad that comes out of these decisions is such, right? So stop and frisk, the thought is, it just doesn't add anything to police resources. They can do their task as well without it, right? So the, a lot of studies are coming out of the US that practice should just not have been there at all. So maybe there's a case in some instances that, police, that the court shouldn't weigh in, but at the time we didn't know, right? We didn't know, so the court did it, and now it's happened, now we know. So please, legislature, act. The debate never stops, right? It's, not, it's never the end of the story with these things. There's a dialogue that's involved. The legislature can always come back and say, look, we're gonna specify. So Black Lives Matter should keep up the pressure, as it were. But in the meantime, you need somewhere to have the discussion, right? And so if it's just the Supreme Court, then too bad, but let it, let it be the Supreme Court is what I wanna say. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, thanks, Francois. that was... Uh no, 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 okay. Um, that was a tremendously rich uh, discussion and paper. Maybe too rich. There's so many moving pieces. Yeah, in that paper. no, I have like a, I have like ten pages of notes. But anyways, okay. So I have three, um, really two pieces and a question, I guess. Which is, the first is that it seems I can't tell what hinges in your paper on this idea that um, the police is, police have heightened duty because they're pursuing these ends. Because someone could also just like flip the gloss and say, you know what, this is the coercive arm of the state, uh, so we should have like increased scrutiny on this body. Like that seems to me like a very traditional liberal concern. So I'm not sure what changes in your paper if you just switch the gloss um, of reading what police are and what police do, as opposed to furthering social goods, as opposed to being like a traditional coercive arm of the state that we want to inflict a lot of scrutiny upon. I don't know yet. Um, the second piece is that it seems that when we're analogizing between uh, the defense of necessity and ancillary powers, there's a level of generality, like a really, uh, so when we're talking about public goods, that's like a very highly generalized thing, as opposed to in the defense of necessity, we're thinking typically of like, aren't we a, like a concrete harm more likely to a person or something like that? It seems to me, um, you'll, you'll, you'll know best. So it's more diffuse. As you're it's more diffuse, yeah. it's tremendously diffuse yeah. when we're thinking about the aim. So to me, that's like a disanalogy between um, mm. what the police are trying to do, broadly furthering under this doctrine of ancillary powers and what's going on in the defense of necessity. But you, if anyone, will be able to sort that out. But it seems <laughs> to me there's something Thank you for your different stuff. there. And then my real question is about, um, isn't 
you say at the end you want to leave this space for ancillary powers, but it seems to me your argument is just like obliterated, and I think that's great. The possibility of there being a successful um, case for ancillary powers, as soon as you collectivize, as right. soon as you think of it as like an institution across time, and that's my question, right, for you? Don't like where is time? Where is, oh, sorry. <laughs> where is time and where is time and institutional memory? Like there's that great British case where it says, you can't say that there's emergency unless you see the Sp Spanish Armada like off the coast, right? Like as soon as you're thinking of like the scale of the state, then like what could an individual do to be threatening its well-being? So like, why wouldn't we have to take like a much larger scale of uh, consideration? The only like way out of it, I think to me, would for you to bring like amazing social science evidence that says even in like a completely robust, historically situated, like long running, historically robust, just community, there's still going to be a couple um, instances of wrongdoing. But like save that argument, it seems to me that like quite successfully this argument uh, so you're saying that by elevating the, the, the standards, you make yeah. it very hard to... Yeah, you actually it. hinted at it in your paper, like as soon as you're starting right. to collectivize. And then my only last point was, um, <laughs> if we're going to collectivize the state, why can't we collectivize communities, okay, as well? And say okay. like this community, as this actually goes to Obi's point as well, like actually this community has long been um, targeted excessively, perniciously. So like uh, the police need to kind of take responsibility for that breakdown as well, so collectivizing, if we're collectivizing certain areas of okay. um, the state, maybe certain areas of the public as well. So, so, so with respect to flipping the, let me just take them in order. The, so, so in my procedure, uh, in my procedural class, I always make sure to emphasize that, look, there's a, so, so it's true that the police in the media do a lot of bad things, right? That's what come out, right? Like they, they, they tase a guy coming out of the streetcar 12 times, right? Like and they target more people of a certain ethnicity in Scarborough. Or like these are the kind of things that we hear all the time. And so I have a lot of this kind of reaction from students saying, you know, rights are the answer and we need to hold the police at bay. But there's always the other side of the equation, which is, look, it's a public good, right? So in fact, it's one of the first public goods in the history of states where we collectivize in order to ensure our collective security, right? In order to prevent people from harming each other. We thought it's easier for the state or a collectivity to realize these kinds of goals than individuals trying in and of themselves, right? So I wanna say, look, that good has to be weighed in, right? You cannot just remove it from the analysis, right? So, so that's how Waterfield works, right? Waterfield says, look, there are these general public duties, they're important, we recognize that. Uh, but then we have to ask, is a power reasonably necessary in order to uh, further them? And in that discussion of whether it's reasonably necessary, they say, here you need to weigh like the magnitude of the right violation, the kind of liberty that you've infringed, like so, so the right with the collective good, right? So I think there is this balanced to be assessed, right? It's very hard, unless you're gonna be a police abolitionist, you wanna go back to a purely anarch anarchical society where there's just no political authority whatsoever, then you're gonna have that question, right? So for me, I'm not sure that I see it as being one side of the counter or the other, you need to take both into account, right? So with respect to, um, yeah, the, the nature of the duties and the kinds of aims that are encapsulated in them, as being broader and more diffuse, right? So possibly if an individual could stop the villain who's gonna press the red button, who's gonna, like, uh, like Kim Jong-un pushing the button on his, nucle on his nukes, going to destroy the entirety of the planet, right? that would be a, a very, very large and <laughs> kind of harm to, to stop. And yet you would say, well, necessity allows you to um, claim the justification that you were allowed to punch him in order to prevent him to do this, right? So I'm not sure that it's so much a difference in kind and a, division, a difference in degree. Typically, in the individual necessity uh, case is gonna be that, yes, it's gonna be an individual, an individualized harm. So I break into a cabin at, 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 when I'm hiking in the winter in the forest because I would die otherwise, so I, I break and enter, or I, I, I burn the field of my neighbor in order to create a buffer zone between the forest fire that's going to come and engulf the village. You might say, well, that's more localized, but it doesn't need to be necessarily. It's just the kind of problems that we're dealing with. Uh, 
The same could be said with respect to the kind of duties that we're talking about, right? So the duty of the police to pr protect life and to protect um, property, well, that can be individualized to they should stop the robber from entering your house, right? But it can also be they could stop all robbers. There's the collectivized di dimension that over time, that's their job of doing that across the board, which is not the case for individuals acting out of necessity. They don't have a role in those circumstances. Right? So, so, so my sense is an individual can act for the public good. Is there, is there really a, a conceptual impossibility here? No. Like I don't, so some people want to say, look, the realm of the state and the realm of individuals, they're very different. Only the state can really realize justice or things like that. I don't tend to think like this. I think you and I can tr strive to, to realize justice. In fact, we can bring a lot more people to try to realize justice. We're going to do it better until we get to a state. A state is just people acting together. It's not a different kind of thing. It's not that just the state can realize justice under the rule of law. With respect to a higher threshold, I wish I had not said that because I'm hoping to put this paper out there and people say, oh, like, that's true. We should heighten the standards, right? And what's that's going to mean? It's going to be, it's going to be very hard to recognize these powers, right? So that's sort of the, another way in which I want to say, look, it's, it's not that the court should just do this blindly, right? They should really have staunch parameters governing what they're trying to do. Um, so I remember when the first, the, 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 our terrorism legislation went to the Supreme Court for the first time around 2003, 2004, Singh, Bagri were the cases around the, related to the air India bombing and, and the inquiry. And so the question there was, should we strike down the law? So there was one case saying this, and the other one was, should these procedures be, um, should, 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 should these proceedings be in public view or should they be in camera? Because there were some, some, um, some provisions in our criminal code that allowed for camera procedures because it was terrorism. Look what the court said. They said, no, we're not going to invalidate them, but we're going to open them up to the public. There's no sort of secretive state thing going on. As a result, how many of these in camera terrorism proceedings do you see is basically kill the legislation, right? It doesn't happen. And so that's a bit of the strategy of that part of the paper is to say, look, there's another way in which you can restrict. While saying it's needed, it's going to be needed. Before you say it is needed, then think hard about what that's going to mean because the standard should be quite demanding. As, as to finally uh, collectivizing the community or the state, so I think communities and states are different in a very salient way in terms of discussion of groups. I think states can be agents in and of themselves because they are organized entities and they can pull everybody's kind of inputs into forms of aggregation that becomes the judgments or the decisions of the state and are not necessarily just that of individuals. Communities are more diffuse. And so far as they don't have that kind of constitutional structure, they can't achieve this kind of decision making that is just their own, right? So some communities might sometimes pull themselves in groups that achieve this, but communities in general. So if you're going to talk about, you know, African Canadians, right? This is too disparate a community to represent an agent. So, so I wouldn't make the same kind of analysis in terms of, well, are the agents, can they, should, they, should African Canadians be held responsible for? Um, that question comes to a head when you're talking about like historical responsibility for past wrongs, et cetera. So, so who are you going to hold responsible, right? So is there a collective that you can hold responsible? Typically, you're going to say the state, right? The reparations should come from the state as opposed to every single one of us because who are we? Like the state might have perjured over time co-agents, the community as a, as a, as a, as a, as it in itself hasn't, right? So, yes. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, Jenny. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed that. So, so one is a kind of background question, which yeah. is, you know, outside of your immediate expertise, but it would really, I think it would really assist in thinking about these questions what do we know from criminology or whatever about how often the kinds of cases that raise these ancillary powers or necessity could have actually been avoided if there were better uh, resources? So if there had been more cops or whatever it is, or they had walkie-talkies where they could you know, re reach a superior immediately, there was a, you know, a red button call available, whatever, it, it would make a difference to actually know yeah. Um, how, how often these kinds of cases are really embedded in that kind of an issue. So, um, but then there's, uh, I, I was really helped by your um, kind of oral version of the rule of law issue because it seemed to me 
that if you take this seriously, um, it does. It goes not in the direction you're looking for. Um, but to say that whenever an ancillary power's type case comes up, or a I think or a necessity case, but in any case, what the judge says is it would be unfair to this individual police officer to deny uh, her the this justification under the circumstances of this case, but. This is never going to happen again unless, so it's exactly the opposite of creating an ancillary mm. power. It's recognizing the individual need, because you highlight that, that there's a complication here. These are, state, these are policies, but now there's an individual mm -hmm. on the line here. So you acknowledge that tension by saying this individual will not be found guilty, will accept this justification, mm. but if, if you ever want to, you, the police force, ever want to raise this again, you get it legislated. You get it actually authorized mm. to do this, even recognizing the laziness of the legislature, whatever. But you say that's what you know. That's what civil liberties require, um, or you fix the resources or your mm. internal mm. organization of things. You get that red button mm. where somebody can call, or you do something. But you can't come back to us with this individual need of unfairness mm. um, without fixing something systemically. But we we don't hold this particular individual in this mm. instance. So, so the thing is, the individual in this instance is not facing jeopardy, right? So Officer McFadden was not charged criminally. So there was a question as to whether um, there was the, the power existed or not. Were the individual's Fourth Amendment rights violated, right? And so the police, the, the, the so U.S. Supreme Court focuses on McFadden, but it's a category mistake is what I'm trying to say, right? So what they're really talking about here is state action, right? Is this kind of state action something that should be held to pass the f muster of the Fourth Amendment. It's always come up in that way, but it's, it's, not, it's not a prosecution of a police officer for uh, illegal behavior and then they're bringing in this. No, but, but, but if the police officer were to say, I were to be charged for illegal action, then the police officer would, the only option would not be to invoke the ancillary power doctrine. Well, in fact, so let me backtrack a little. They could, but not in the same way, right? So. So what the police officer would do is it would invoke the, de the defense of necessity insofar as it's available to him. And then section 25 of, uh, 25 of our subsection one of our criminal code says, if you have the power to do X, then that's gonna be deemed to be justifiable. So you could, the police officer could invoke it in this way, right? So it's a power which through a provision of the criminal code is made into a defense, right? But that's never been really invoked, right? That's not where we've seen the ancillary power doctrine arise. Where it arises in the context of discussions of Section 8 and Section 9 of the Charter, where it's really the state action that is in question. And in so far as that's the case, right, you could say, well, and in fact, the courts, some strands of the court seem to say this, we're just deciding this case, right? It's a totality of circumstances test. Where, so the circumstances of this test is where the power to, so uh, Clayton and Farmer is a good example where most recently the court says, look, and so they, they, um, the police receives a 911 call. Somebody says, look, there are uh, 10 black men um, standing in front of a strip club and four of them have guns. The police come along and they set up a roadblock in, fr in front of the parking lot and they stop the first car coming out. Yeah? So they don't have any power to do this. There's no power in the legislation or in the jurisprudence that says, you, you know, there's the manpower of investigative detention, but they don't even have suspicion that the people in this car are the, they just stopped the first car. And the court says, in these circumstances, look, there was a 911 call. These people were coming out of the parking lot close to the strip club. Oh, it happens to be that the drivers were black. Yeah, so that's enough to recognize the power to do roadblock in those circumstances. So you might think, okay, that's just a, a case by case case. And uh, you know, if, if it were like Chinese people or if it were not street, uh, if, if it was not a, a strip club, it were a, a, a Chinese restaurant, then the power would not be recognized. That's not how the court tend to deal with this. Even though Justice Abella says in this case, it's just this case, the way it's been interpreted is now there's a power to do roadblocks, right? And so there's no pressure on the legislature to act. If indeed the court were to take that stance, you might say, well, maybe that's one thing the court could do. Say, we're just gonna do it here, but it's not gonna happen again, right? So we're telling you, we're now flagged that this is a practice, right? So now it's out there, right? So 
do something about it because otherwise we're going to come back to it. And now it's in the realm of what we're recognizing, but not fully. So that might be a halfway house that could be considered, right? So it's still in line with my argument that it, the court ought to weigh in. The question is to what extent? Yeah. Uh, also, you mentioned also, yeah, I think yeah, we're there. <laughs> what do we know about the criminology? Oh yeah, the criminology. So, yeah, so, 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 so here's hindsight is 20, I tried to allude to that in my talk, hindsight is 2020, right? So with stop and frisk, which is a 1960s power that was recognized in the US, we're starting to have now data which shows, just don't engage with this, it just doesn't help at all, right? But that's, you know, 50 years on, right? So the problem with these behaviors is that when they get to the court, there has been no criminological studies into them typically because they were not known to the wider public, right? So it's a bit of a, a sort of a uh, it, 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 epistemic failure here. You, do, you, you can't uh, criminologically assess because you don't know that it's going on. So far as you know, yes, you should criminologically assess that that should probably be part of the analysis, right? You should probably have these, you know, Brown v. Board kind of footnotes on social science saying, if we're going to weigh into this, we should at least pay some attention to this, right? But the problem is typically there is not. Like, so stop and frisk in Canada, you could have said, look, we should have looked at the US data. But then it's very funny what's happening in Canada. Is it, you, you might know this, we have this kind of, you know, Janus face um, uh, sort of persona where we, really like to absorb everything, at least in criminal procedure that comes out of the US. Whenever there's a new power, we say, well, we should recognize it too. But when it comes to social reality, we tend to think, yeah, but we're different, right? So, and, and so we really need to have local studies. We, we could maybe anecdotally relate to what's going on in the US, but we can't really say it for a fact. So is that enough to cite in a judgment? It just doesn't tend, because of course, interveners in these cases are making these, these arguments galore. Canadian Civil Liberties Association, right? Oh, like the question of race is always brought up, very rarely considered, right? So we're not even talking about the social science evidence, it's that the relevant criteria are not all considered because of the politically sort of loaded environment. So, so yes, <laughs> I want to say, but the dynamic here is, is trying to address something that is happening, that is not known, you want to get some handle on it, you, get the, you want the law to get some handle on it without doing too much damage. How do you do this? So you've presented an alternative I presented another. I think we need to talk about this, is the point. Like, so criminal procedure has to be theorized a bit more for these very reasons, because that's where the shit goes down, if you want. <laughs> yes? Well, first and foremost, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Very much enjoyed it. And now the question. And now the question, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, actually, I mean, what I want to talk about kind of was alluded to in the last two questions as well, but maybe at a slightly more abstract level. I'm just thinking more about this principle of necessity versus a principle of proportionality um, in terms of when we're thinking about the state as being the accused, right? So we've been talking about, you know, individual police officers and they have a defense of necessity. But I'm just wondering, particularly when if necessity does what you want it to do, or, and maybe you could explain it further to me as a stranger to this jurisdiction. Because, so, for example, in Perka, one thing that you didn't kind of talk about was the fact that they, they characterize necessity as this moral invol involuntariness. And right. I'm not sure how you square that up with the state as being morally involuntary. And maybe that's oh, yeah, okay, I, maybe I you can just say, yeah, because my understanding it's, is that people are a bit like, oh, that's-, that's So that, but that's why I said Canada doesn't recognize lesser evil as yes. a justification. It just recognizes it as an excuse. It's a very muddled uh, defense. And the point of doing that, they said, well, if, they have this perverse kind of argument where they say, if you recognize a justification, it's, a, it's basically a permission to act. So you're permitting people to take the law into their own hands. And that's anathema to the rule of law. So therefore, we're going to recognize necessity, but only as a, you know, a, a pressure of circumstances kind of defense. Yeah. Right? So if you were acting in a morally involuntary way, they say, such that no reasonable person should have been uh, expected to behave better than you have, yeah. then we're going to recognize the defense. But that's not what I'm talking about here. Right, yeah, so I'm sure. talking about the balancing of evil, which is a straight out Absolutely. justificatory necessity. But that, so that's kind of, for me, I'm thinking that there's a different emphasis there, right? So it, generally with a principle of necessity, the way right. I've always seen it is the idea that it's, you're looking for a justification, whereas you yeah. said yourself, we're talking here, it's, it's not necessarily permission or a mandate we're talking right. about, it's a power. Right. 
And so in terms of the pow a power that the state already has, are we, not, are we not better describing that power in terms of whether it's proportionate? What does necessity give you that a principle of proportionality doesn't? I guess would be my ultimate question. So, so one of the points to be made here is that, so the defense of necessity qua lesser evil doesn't have an intrinsic proportionality kind of component, right? So the point is, it can be necessary for me to, um, so I mean, you have to weigh the evils, but that's, that's, over, that, that, that's where it stops, right? So that's what defines the necessity. With respect to ancillary powers, the way it's set up is you have this kind of balancing but normally when there's, there's an infringement of right in Canada, there's a question to be asked about whether that infringement can be justified or saved under the saving provision of our constitution, which is section one. Right? And section one has a whole fleshed out proportionality criterion in and of itself. What's happening in, under the ancillary power doctrine is the court is just basically not going under section one, it's saying we're gonna apply the ancillary powers doctrine instead as the justification. So the proportionality bit is not fleshed out as much as it, as it should. So in the Clayton case, which I mentioned, the roadblock case, Justice Binney, of course, there's a long dissent about how you can do that, right? We need to go under Section 1 and, 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 and sort of methodically go through the proportionality analysis, right? So there is a balancing, right, under the, so to the good and the necessity to prevent some you know, th th to make sure that, 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 so the necessity of infringing a constitutional right given the weight of, you know, the duty or the important good that would be realized by the police duty, that's kind of the, the balancing where it's at. But we don't have fixed criteria of what would be proportionate, right? It's just, it's just a straight out balancing analysis, right? And that's where we're stuck with. So you want to say, should there be more of a proportionality analysis? Well, our court tells us there should be in general, just not in this context. So, so there's definitely a space for this kind of reasoning, you know, in, but is, it, it's not present. So should it be brought in? That's a good point, right? So maybe that's another way of saying, look, you can maybe cabin the doctrine even a bit more by doing this, right? The point is that ship has sailed in so far as the current jurisprudence is concerned. And so, so that's not the route I took, but it could be an important one to take, right? So that's another avenue of inquiry for this paper, right? Um, first of all, I'll start by apologizing by saying I, I showed up because I got an email, so I didn't have a chance to read the paper in advance. That's fine. <laughs> Apologies um, so accepted. My, uh, my, my question will be limited by that. Um, the, um, um, I, I, I'm guessing your, your emphasis here is on the general jurisprudential issues or the, or the criminal law focus. Um, so it's both, really. Yeah, <laughs> but, but I'm thinking it probably would be a good idea to expand it. Um, <laughs> so, so I'm just saying, yeah, just 40 and, 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 pages is what it's at now. Well, I could try an American law well, journal, well, but then that would. <laughs> and, 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 and that's, and, and I think that's the dilemma with this topic: is how far into the weeds do you want to get? Yeah. Um, because uh, it seems to me that the, the general kind of question you're talking to arises in a number of contexts, and, and particularly, I would think civil liability is a good one when you're talking about collective responsibility, uh, because of course the action, you know, people are vi vicariously liable for the. For the for the the torts of police officers, right, um, and and that and this is where I say where you get into the weeds because I think I I I, I did a quick check because I and I'm not sure but but I'm pretty sure that technically OPP officers are employees of Her Majesty so I, I think if you're really being fussy on the pleading points you're supposed to sue the Queen although it's doubtless the the budget of the Commissioner of the OPP that pays the damages. Um, in, in the event, but I'm pretty sure you sue the Queen if you want somebody vicariously liable for a tort of a police officer. Um, if, it's a, if it's a municipal force, it's different, right? <laughs> um, I think you sue the City of Toronto or maybe the Toronto Metropolitan, the, yeah. the, the police board, right? Yeah. It, depending on what the legislation says. And, and this is what I mean specifically by getting into the weeds. Yeah. So um, in terms but, of, in terms but on the other hand, even though an OPP officer is, a, is an employee of Her Majesty the Queen, and the Queen would be vicariously liable, yeah. And of course, the queen's not going to be liable for a crime. Um, that, but <laughs> the uh, although Crown Corporation could be, <laughs> right? Uh, but 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 um, I, but I don't think the OPP is a Crown Corporation. I think I, I think the no no but I think you, I, they I, don't I, need a Crown I Corporation. The, I think the Commissioner read a, read a criminal code, public entity. Yeah, well, it's never I, been well, defined. Or, or, we don't or, or a criminal in institution, right? right. Or a criminal organization, right? There's that stuff oh, in the criminal but, 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 code too. Clearly, okay, but yeah, and, but or that, a conspiracy. 
Are, are, are you analogizing the police to that? Well, they, I mean, okay. s s some group of some particular group of police officers could be a criminal yeah, yeah, of organization, course. of course, or a conspiracy. Yes, right. Um, but but again, if you're if and if you're but but the commissioner is not the employer. The commissioner. I'm just sticking with the OPP example. The commissioner is not the employer, but he does have statutory powers to discipline, and that's another way these cases yeah. could come up. Not in a criminal prosecution or in a in a tort action, but they could come up in a disciplinary context, when when you've got judicial review of the police of disciplinary action by the commissioner, and of course the other way that you've alluded to that these cases arise is whether whether some person interacting with the police is guilty of obstructing the police, or of resisting arrest, right? So so and it seems to me the context is very important. If as I say, if you're going to get into the weeds, yeah, um, I, mean, I mean there are clearly different ways of addressing. <laughs> Of possibly addressing these issues insofar as they come up. Yeah. Right? It has to be flagged as an issue before it can be addressed in any of these ways, though. But, but if you're talking about state responsibility, I think, I think you really do need to get into the weeds and talk about the tort cases. So, so the question is, so what, why are you saying this? Because there would be direct analogies? With well, no, because, because th these are clear-cut, everyday examples of collective liability for the conduct of the police officer. And, and the insurance concerns, undoubtedly, or the, or the budgetary concerns, will, will impact the way the, the, the court respond, the, the, the forces, the different forces, to speak less technically, uh, respond to these day-to-day -day situations. Right, so... Because they'll have budgetary implications at the very least. So I understand, but so for the matter to be considered uh, as a tort, for the matter to be considered as... Um, a disciplinary hearing, it needs to be brought to the attention of the court, right? It's well, not necessarily a court in the first instance. Well, so, well, it needs to be recognized somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and, stop, and there are lots of cases. That's and, and the problem with a lot of these behaviors, so stop and frisk was this, like you have decades of p the police engaging with stop and frisk. The police, they're happy with it. So there's obviously no internal disciplinary procedures. And so the question, you know, I'm not aware of a question where, it, of an issue where it comes up as a, where somebody privately prosecute. And then you end up with the question, well, individuals typically don't have the resources to prosecute these cases. It take a very wealthy individual to be at the receiving end for, of such a practice for the case to emerge. And typically, as Obi pointed out, they're not the ones who tend to be at the receiving end. So, so it's just yeah, that- Well, it, it, and if you're limiting stop for us, that's fine. But there are other scenarios that, that, that come up, like, like for another example is the case where, um, I saw one in the news recently, one of these high-speed chases kind of things where, the, where, where undoubtedly the, the officer has a duty to arrest, but the, but the degree of but what force is necessary is, is an issue. Right. Right? And when it comes to the point of endangering third parties, right. not, not nearly so much as force is, is, is necessary right? and, and ought to be avoided. So it, it, it very much depends on the particular facts, I think. So the question of what force is reasonably necessary in the circumstances, that's a directly analogous analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, so, and, and just a general comment on the word right. necessary. It's, 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 it's always important, I think, to stress necessary for what. Oh, yeah. But that, <laughs> you know, like, cause, you know, I, you know, we know so we, taking we, a piece of bread to, to, to avoid starvation is one thing. Taking a piece of bread to avoid being hung, hungry until dinner time is another thing. Taking a piece of bread to, to, to avoid a, miss, missing a wonderful taste possibility oh, yeah. is a different kind but of But I necessity. think both of these analyses assume so, that that but, evaluation but goal is in. But it's a question right. of... But it needs to be spent, you know, necessary to avoid a loss of life or necessary to... to right, so it needs to be a lesser evil. So necessarily in the individual, in the criminal law context, you make that assessment. Is it lesser than, the, and in a case like this, maybe not, right? And in the context of the ancillary power doctrine, you have these duties that are already specified vis-a-vis -vis the infringement of rights. So you, you know what you're talking about, right? It, it's not happening in the abstract. But, no, but, yeah. but, but it's, always, it's always a tricky thing when talking about necessity. To, to not of course, of course, of course, of course. Of course, right? So, you know, there are many ways of thinking about necessary. So I, I, I imagine I dropped a stain of ketchup on my shirt, right? You know, just before a job interview. You might think, well, it would have been, you know, necessary for me to buy a new shirt. But is it really? There's a, there's a relative assessment to be made, right? So, <laughs> so yes. Does anything here in your argument turn on the analogy between the criminal idea of necessity, lesser evil, evils, and the ancillary power? So let's say, for example, I didn't agree that there was any analogy between the criminal idea of necessity and lesser evils and the ancillary powers. 
would that matter for your argument? So could I still take your whole argument mm -hmm. for how to understand ancillary powers, um, and but but just reject the analogy with uh, the criminal law and the defense of necessity? Yeah, I think so. I think I think I think you could do that, right? So the way I use these two are mostly as comparators. So I use necessity yeah. as this is a doctrine that we've had for a long time. Here are some criteria, and yeah. the courts seem to inspire themselves from these criteria. Yeah. And I'm saying, look, they're mostly different for yeah. these reasons. Right. So you might say, okay, even if they're not analogi analo analogizable, yeah. Yeah. then there's still an argument that's self-standing about what should be the standard of that doctrine, right? So then I would need to know more about what the grounds are for this analogizing them, but. Uh, yeah, well, so, so I guess just to suggest, I mean, it just seems to me a few things come up that suggest that it's not an analogy, right? right? So the fact that at most we regard it as an excuse, whether whereas... In, in this in this jurisdiction. Well, so, yeah, but so but if, if this is a jurisdiction that recognizes an ancillary power, but treats So notice that that's why I use the U.S. also in this paper, because yeah. there there's a jurisdiction where you have both. And they right? treat so, like um, a lesser evils kind of thing as a, as a justification. Or yes, lesser evil is a straight out justification in most U.S. states. Yeah. So, but let's say you thought that they it's were like... They're in the model penal codes, right? The yeah. Many, many states have adopted So, it. I guess the question is, let's say you thought the United States was getting it wrong and, and we've got it right, right? If it's anything, it's got to be... Right. I mean, let's say we want to distinguish between something like self-defense, where mm -hmm. we want to say uh, the, my right to my own person mm -hmm. is at stake, or let's say my mm -hmm. property, and something where you're doing something that would really be more like engaging in a like lesser evil exercise, right? Right. that seems like self-defense, I don't think we normally think about as just choosing the lesser of two evils. Actually, um, I, but, I actually think that it's one instance of it, the, but that's personal. That would be like personally. a particular way of, yeah. and I would think controversial way of viewing self-defense, because like, yeah. as a matter of... No, um, no, I, 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 many people don't see it like yeah, this. Yeah, right. And so, if I get, yeah. there, there are probably good arguments where that shouldn't be, right? So, so but, that's my thought, right? So that in, in a way I might think, okay, I self-defense, okay, that's a justification. And then in the private law context, um, you know, borrowing someone's property to protect my own property, that's a justification. But yeah. um, other sort of broader ideas of um, just choosing the lesser of two evils, right. um, you might so you think, think that could at most be an excuse, but not actually a justification. And just let's say you thought that, I still think I could buy your whole story of how to Oh, yeah, no, I, th I, think, I think that's possible. Powers. So yeah. necessity is there to inform, it's just to say, look, here are possible criteria, let's yeah. just think, because the court actually tends to piggyback on, the, or, it says, in some, like, there's a case called Campbell where you, yeah. the court actually piggybacking on it squarely. Yeah. But presumably, I could just ignore yeah. and then say. But then the question is, would the your rejection of the defense in the criminal law context entail a rejection in the constitutional context? Because if I'm saying they're like in in broad parts similar, then why is it in one or not in one or the other? Well, you might think that it, it, it's not for an individual to um, um, think about balancing rights against the common good, but but that is precisely what right. the government does need to do in some cases, right? So that's why, why you might think we shouldn't have anything like a, do a lesser evil doctrine because right. individuals should not be making um, those types of calculations, but the state does need to make those types mm -hmm. of calculations. And so we should have something like an ancillary power right. defined in the precise way you say, but reject anything like the idea that individuals should be doing that same thing. So possibly. So my own view tend to be that at some point, lesser evil has to kick in, right? Because at some point, you might not want individuals to make all kinds of decisions, but sometimes the ratio is going to be such that, look, humanity is going to disappear if I don't punch this guy, of course this guy has to be justified, right? The question is more when it becomes more murky, right? So some people some people would not want to go down this road. Yeah, right. A lot of people down the road wouldn't want to go down this road. Pretty but much it, used at the most, but not justified. So, right. So yeah. that goes into the discussion of why it is that the states is better suited to make these kinds of decisions. And then we could have a long, decision, a long discussion yeah. about why I think that's not the case. I yeah. hinted at that when I responded to uh, Emily and, and said, you know, the state for me is not a distinct yes. kind of entity, mm -hmm. right? It's just people working together mm -hmm. and the state can fail. And mm -hmm. those failures is the failure of people acting together. I don't think the state is 
uniquely placed to realize certain things. I think it can do it better, mm -hmm. right? So it's a, it's, it's a matter of degree. Right. And so that's why these kinds of yeah. comparisons are easier for me to make. Yeah. Um, where somebody might want to say, look, it's, it's just completely disingenuous for you. I mean, <laughs> I think I, you know, uh, I had the, I didn't have a Nadler, but I had a Brudner raising a certain kind of objection oh, really? of that sort. <laughs> 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 the last time I presented this paper, and I, and I can see this. The, so there are certain assumptions in this paper, right? So, so if the assumption falls, then okay, maybe the, the, the analysis um, falls also. No, but, but I think maybe a, not. So in a way, that's my question, right? right. So let's say I don't right. buy that story on right. the criminal law front, right? And okay. let's say I do think there's something special about the state right. that it's uniquely suited to provide public So goods. the question then is, what's the benchmark? So now I'm using ne individual necessity as the benchmark for, I'm saying, you know, it should be higher for the state. You know, you, the court yeah. should look at resources, you know, yeah. more like it does in that case, yeah. you know, and so I'd need to think, like the analysis would need to be reformatted in a way that take something else. That's well, the, maybe it would sound more like a proportionality analysis, but maybe, yes. but maybe you're right. You wouldn't be able to say more than the individual. Exactly. But, but I'm wondering again whether that's crucial for for your basic idea. Which, I think some of the basic ideas, mm -hmm. no. Yeah. Right. So yeah. the fact that the court should look into the resources of the state, well, that's not necessarily a there's an institutional, you know, design a competence problem, but it's not. It's within the state, so yeah. it's not necessarily. The same objection as saying, should the court ask, you know, what the situation of the individual was and, yeah. and how that's, ana that's analyzed, maybe. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. So are there any other comments or questions? We're almost at time. Francois, do you have anything else you want to add? No. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you <laughs> very much. Instructive. Thank you.